Check, check. Hey there, how is everyone? Uh, good to see you. Well, I can't see you. <laughs> um, so today I just wanted to just talk DevOps. Um, I hope that we get some people coming in the chat and asking questions, bringing up topics that they'd like to discuss. You know, I've been in DevOps, IT, uh, systems administration, software development for over 20 years. Um, made a lot of mistakes, so that's probably something that you could benefit from. But maybe you can avoid making the same mistakes I've made. Uh, a few things I could talk through, though, in the meantime, while waiting to see if we've got anyone who's got anything they want to bring up or talk about, um, you know, some of the stuff that I am especially interested in that I'd love to get some, some people in talking about, um, bringing in different opinions would be, you know, Kubernetes. Um, I'm a fan of Kubernetes, but I, I really can't find the line where it makes sense to have it. Or not to have it. Um, like one of the biggest things is expense. So weighing up the difference in the expense between infrastructure expenses versus uh, personnel expenses, uh, the expense of uh, lost opportunities because you are spending too much time managing automation scripts or Terraforms or Ansible's uh, where potentially you could manage the same with something as something like Kubernetes uh, that will take a lot of that off your own plate. Um, but it's not a one-to-one -one sort of thing. So if you need one load balanced server and you've got some application that you can use for load balancing in front of it, you're talking about two servers. But if it's in Kubernetes, you know, of course that's gonna be, well, probably six, uh, <laughs> depending on how you're managing it. And that's likely per environment. I mean, there's namespaces, but I don't know. I've not seen. I have not seen a lot of people who take their uh, namespaces and use it across multiple environments. Uh, I do have one colleague who is very much for that. Uh, well, I mean, production is likely different. So, one Kubernetes environment for non-prod and one for prod. That makes sense. Um, and then, you know, you could have dev staging QA, 
the reason I would say having separate environments for prod versus non-prod is that you have the ability to test upgrades of Kubernetes itself. And I think that's a pretty strong case for a reason for having those separate. But, you know, if you, if you, if you throw Kubernetes into the mix, the expense goes way up. There's just a need for overhead that Kubernetes brings. Um, I don't know, I'd love to get a few people together to argue that point uh, with uh, respect for each other's opinions, right? Um, so a, a, a reasonable discussion as opposed to some sort of fight about it. So I'm... Um, um, some of the other stuff would be, you know, where, when Docker does or doesn't make sense, you know, there's a lot of new containers, well, not new, but emerging, I guess, container systems for running, running containers that are coming out or becoming more popular. So I think there's um, Podman, I believe, is one of the main ones I've been hearing lately. And I don't think that it is for necessarily building containers, but it is, it's for running them. Let me see. Podman is a utility provided as part of the libpod library. It can be used to create and maintain containers. Okay. Um, so, you know, with Kubernetes now not having, not running on Docker. It, uh, it, let's see, how, how did they phrase that? Kubernetes. Docker. Docker. Wow, I misspelled that altogether. Um, deprecating. Yes. Well, that's such a big word. No. Um, so deprecating Docker within Kubernetes that it now runs on. Uh, what was it running on? Um, so it is all based on that, the open container initiative, the OCI. So OCI compliant. And I think that it was the, the overhead, the shimming that was required to enable Docker to work was the biggest reason to take it out. Um, just looking to see what it's being. What container Uh, runtime. So runtimes that use the container runtime interface CRI created for, let's see, let's use TLDR. Docker as an underlying runtime is being deprecated in favor of runtimes that use the container runtime interface CRI created for Kubernetes. Docker produced images will continue to work in your cluster with all runtimes as they always have. So if you're just an end user of Kubernetes, not much is changing. Uh, and doesn't mean you can't use Docker as a development tool anymore. Docker is still a useful tool for building containers and the images resulting from Docker build can still be run in the cluster. Uh, container D, right, of course. So container D will be So what's this? Uh, you will need to make sure your worker nodes are using a supported container runtime. So the worker nodes need to be changed to if you're using a managed Kubernetes service like GKE, EKS, or AKS, which defaults to container D, you will need to make sure your worker nodes are using a supported container runtime before Docker support is removed. 
So if you have node customizations, you may need to update them. And of course, rolling your own cluster would require updates. Yeah, so that wasn't even what I was talking about. It was, you know, I like containers. It makes porting the application around a lot easier. But then again, also when you aren't able to run an entire application suite locally, does that still make sense? I mean, I suppose the containers are definitely going to be faster than trying to, you know, bake images like we used to do. You know, you, I mean, I guess people still do that depending on their, their, um, environment, their configuration, their infrastructure, their environment, whatever. Um, no. I mean, I can't see myself moving away from them unless serverless works. I mean, I know there are places that are running it, but I think running serverless still has its own set of oddities or issues. So, you know, there, there's overhead involved in running that serverless especially for the management of deploying it. So I'd love to see a discussion on that as well. Um, let's see, what else do we have happening in the DevOps world? <clears throat> let's see, let's uh, look at this. Uh, there we go. Let's switch over here. So I thought this was a uh, interesting article on dev, dev.to. It's a uh, technologist's replacement for medium would be how I would describe it to someone. Um, so uh, if you haven't seen this, there there are a number of what are called roadmaps for uh, different technology stacks. So roadmap to full stack I think that was the first one that I became aware of and I'm not seeing the one that I thought was the most popular uh, now I think people have just kind of hijacked the term or the title. And, and I'm pretty sure I saw them on GitHub, right? So, uh, map to full stack developer, I'll say on GitHub. Is this the one? Are there any stars on this guy? That's three years ago. Um, oh, well, this is the Ruby on Rails one. Oh, here we are. Yeah, stars 46. That might have been it, but I really don't think so. I can't remember. Um, but just let's take a look through what our man moved. Mubashir Mustafa, I had to say. Sorry if I butchered your name and you happen to come across this. Um, Cross-functional mindset makes your team more agile. Yes, of course. Agreed with that. Agree. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Thinking of how your work impacts those around you totally makes the team better if you only care about your environment your area of concern then 
you're going to have issues that aren't considered. Um, so agreed. Um, let's see. Practice culture to remove the barrier between developers who develop apps, write code, and are responsible for implementing features, requests, bug fixes, etc., and operators who deploy those apps, manage IT infrastructure servers, and are responsible for uptime, security, stability, and scalability. Yes, and product owners and security. So I think. I think um, DevStar Ops. So Dev Ops came first. Then there were things like DevSec Ops. So Development Security Ops. But I think it's DevStar Ops was a popular term a couple of years ago. Uh, da, 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 da. I need uh, space in there. Doug Go is ignoring, ignoring the asterisk, a star. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is a site that is, is talking about it. Uh, I know I'd seen it in quite a number of things leading up to DevOps days in London a few years ago. Let's see. So still on what is DevOps collaboration between operators, sysadmins, DB administrators, developers, testers. Yeah. Yeah. A movement that essentially prevents people from saying, but it works on my local host. Hmm. Don't necessarily disagree. We still see that. Um, there, let's say prevents might be too strong a word, but, uh, moves away from is probably the better way to put it. How to become a DevOps person from a technical standpoint. Computer programming, any language will do. Primarily, you should be able to write scripts. Okay. I. Yes. Um, de I mean, definitely agree that the more you're able to program, understand what's involved in developing software, the easier it is to convey the needs of operations if you're coming from an operations mindset obviously if you're coming from a developer mindset then there are other things to consider uh from a from the operations side that you would not have been exposed to quite as frequently linux unix for sure, there is a lot less need for Windows servers nowadays. Um, I mean, I guess there are other servers in there, too, that we could talk about or discard. But what's the point, really? Um, I haven't seen a lot of... Uh, well, no, I take that back. Uh, mainframes still are a significant chunk of processing that happens out there. If you spend money, travel, or um, I know there, there's one other industry, but it, it your data goes through dozens of mainframes every day. Computer networking, definitely. That is important. Um, and I mean, all of these things are... I guess it depends on the specific role. You know, you've got uh, 
different levels of how much you need to know of each of these and having a good mix of people on the team who know a bit more of one thing or another that is usually a lot better than having carbon copies of a single person so that's one thing that is extremely important when hiring is not to hire yourself over and over again you want people who are different than you because otherwise otherwise why do you need their opinion right so do you want a diverse group of people with different backgrounds so that they can point out things that you haven't thought of extremely important containerization yeah that's what i was just saying um you know i i still like it but it's one of those things where often as technologists we learn about something new and cool and shiny and we want to inflict it on everything and i think the key is figuring out the art of Should this be the solution for what we're trying to implement? Not, this is what we're going to use because it's what I want to use. It's very hard to, to not do that because, you know, we're, there's so many nice, shiny new technologies that we see coming around and we all want the opportunity to toy with them. Um, yeah, so let's, there's that OCI compliant one. Let's just, I wonder if there's anything interesting right here on this page. Uh, let's see if there's anything in that. Nah, nothing, nothing to talk about right now there. Uh, orchestration, Docker Swarm. I haven't really seen a lot of that lately. Uh, Kubernetes, definitely. Mesos. I, I know of it. I have not used it myself. Um, okay, so it's from Apache. I think I... Was it the Mesosphere? Was that thing? Yeah, don't know. I anybody's got any experience with that? I'd love to hear about it. Um, but yes, you definitely need to know Kubernetes now. I, it's I'm constantly seeing requirements for that. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that it should be what you implement. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be, but it is top of the list for a lot of people. Cloud platforms, AWS, Azure, GCP. Yeah, definitely. You, um, once you know one really well, it's pretty easy to translate a lot of that knowledge over to another cloud provider, but also having a a bit of an understanding of the other providers. So if you know AWS really well, you should spend some time in Azure. Um, I myself want to spend a little more time in Google Cloud. Um, not necessarily to inflict it on everything callback there, um, but to see how it compares, what, what I like about it, what I don't like about it. Yeah, I'd say there's so many different products and they're coming out so quickly that actually just spending a little bit of time in each of the provider, cloud providers will let you accidentally stumble across something that you didn't know existed. Like I found 
it's been a little while now, but Azure, Azure containers, no, not containers. Um, Azure container service. Container instances, there we are. That is a container without Kubernetes. Um, so you run an instance of a container. It's a, a Fargate, AWS Fargate. Is the equivalent. Well, it, yeah, I mean, equ equivalent is the right word. I don't know that they're necessarily equal. Um, don't know that they're not, but there's a lot of services that are similar, but completely disparate between this, the different providers. For instance, Dynamo DB and Cosmos DB. So Dynamo DB from AWS is a NoSQL database as a service. And so is Cosmos DB. But the way they are implemented is extremely different. And I am not a big fan of the way the billing is done within Azure's Cosmos DB, but that's a whole different story. Um, not necessarily that it's right or wrong. It just doesn't suit the needs of someone who wants a MongoDB as a service, that type of thing. CI, CD, CD, so continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery, definitely. Um, knowing what those are and what tools there are and how you can use them. It's getting easier and easier. You know, it used to be the only option really was Jenkins, but now you've got, you know, Circle CI, GitHub Actions, Bitbucket Pipelines, GitLab, still use Jenkins, the AWS code build, code pipeline, and GCP cloud build. Um, this isn't really mentioning the uh, types of tools that you can use for, well, I guess these can do that, but I guess there are other services for building, say, iOS applications that are probably a little better known uh, bitrise i believe is the bit rise yeah so build android and ios apps through automation so when you merge to a specific branch you can kick off the build and deliver those through test flight for iOS or Air Hockey for Android. So it's really nice to know that once a merge happens, that it's just going to deliver that to your phone or, or phones. Don't need to learn all the tools. 100% true. 100% true. Um, So let's see that those are things that are a good start. There are some significant areas for improvement here. Um, let's say we've got uh, what, like one of the big things that I believe needs to be Reached more, uh, not that I think everyone needs to 100% follow these, but it is a place that you should absolutely start uh, 12 factor apps. So these are the 12 factors that make for good apps. And I think there's even a, a, a 
change for was it um vector apps for mobile or was it microservices mm. microservices Mm, I'm not saying it now. Doesn't matter, but understanding these elements and how that is accomplished is is gigantic. Now, if you can find a reason that you specifically do not want to comply to one of these and you've got a good case for it, yeah, sure. I mean, that's I think all of these things are more of a guideline than they are a requirement or a demand. Um, I mean, I cannot find C uh, so having a code base tracked in inversion control. Yeah, so Git. I I don't see any reason why you would not want to have your code in Git. And I guess if you've got some other Legacy system, sure. Um, I mean, I've used some of the other types, and yeah, it can work. But it, I mean, it's still a version control, right? Why, why not? No reason not to um, explicitly declare isolated dependency. So let's just look at that page for a second. Um, so I was checking to see if there were any examples here, but pinning a version as opposed to the latest version. That's if you don't do that, then if you're using the latest version, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to end up out of sync because one service or library or dependency has updated to some level that potentially breaks. Um, has breaking changes. It could, well, I mean, breaking changes explains it all, really. So if, if you pin what you've got, then you know that even if you have to roll back to a point in time, that it will work the way it was supposed to at that point in time. Without that, you have... Different. So even in a rollout of from test to prod, you could end up with a, um, a difference in versions and that could change the, the way the behavior. So then your versions. So that just means having an explicit version. So, uh, let's use NPM for an example. Just seeing if they had a specific example here, but yeah, there we go. So this means uh, greater than 1.9, I think. Okay, so it's it's 1.9, 1.9.1, and so on. Uh, about means auto merge minor auto merge patch right um, but I I like equals suited the exact version um, I mean it, it it depends you know on how how often your code changes how often you do deployments how often your dependencies change but a bit of or is that an actual yeah and to see if there's a nice example handy but it should be easy enough to find one um when you're not paying attention to other things here we go uh no that's not i was just looking for the declaration from a package.json file um 
Yeah, so you see, there we go. It's just that. So that is the exact version. That is... I'm going to say the minor and the tilde is a patch. So... Um, store your configs in the environment. Agreed. Now, I've seen reasons where... Um, this will also be in source control, but your, you want your deployed assets to pull the config from the environment it's in. That way your package can be the same across dev prod testing, whatever, um, then you know that the version you're running in test is the same version you've got in prod because it's the exact same assets. So all you have to do is update the database connection, the other secrets, um, whatever. But if you have to do a build for each environment, that can be not so good. Sometimes it's hard to work around, but it, you know, it, it should be a goal of trying to get to where you get your config from your environment. So again, if, if anybody's got anything specific about DevOps, they want to talk about, I am thrilled to do so. Um, treat backing services as attached resources. Um, So let's see if it, yeah. So attaching to those additional resources through a URL or a URI, as opposed to sharing details through files or when possible, not using the same exact database connection between uh, multiple services. Uh, strictly separate the build, release, and run. Love that one. Uh, so if you've got one pipeline that does everything, then you have to start from zero to get to a deployment. But if you can build, use that build to release to dev because it is pulling its config from the environment, then... You can then also, so you've released that and then you've run it. So those separate, but closely bound together, I suppose. Um, but then you can go from dev to test where it's getting its, you know, it's config from the environment. So the only thing that's changing is the config. Then the same for prod. But if you were not able to do the three of those separately, it's going to be much harder to uh, have that accomplished without having to start from the beginning for each environment. Um, yeah, so ex uh, execute the app as one or more stateless processes. What are... Yes, stateless. That is the key in this. Um, do not share anything amongst your processes. So don't require sharing the file system. Don't require sharing kernel or memory space. Uh, don't require sharing specific um, elements of your existence or even your libraries. Um, because if that prevents you from being able to spread them horizontally as meaning different services on different um, hosts or binding right so i mean we're pretty familiar with this pattern by now i would hope that you expose your service to support and access it that way there are more than 
there is more than one way to connect to services though it's not just http you know there are rpc there are um quite a number of different protocols that you can use to connect trying to find the right protocol is another interesting conversation i would love to have with someone um you know it's a somebody who has truly implemented more rpc grpc um those types of protocols be great to to hear their perspective concurrency scaling up via the process model did i say that right yeah uh, the process model well is it not opening yeah so enabling the ability to add additional elements to your workload to spread that so if you have web workers that receive requests and workers in the background that process the requests then if your web services or web workers well not web workers because that's you know specific to uh browsers but your web processes can handle more connections than the workers backing them can handle then having more backers on the the worker side to enable passing traffic or delivering traffic faster without having to increase everything just increasing the small bit so but doing that in a services way versus a microservices way where if you have a small team you want to separate the right number of elements and not try to break everything into a million different pieces if you've only got one or two people working on something. Um, once you start to scale out to more people in the team, then it starts to really make sense. You know, so, so I read it yesterday. Um, microservices solves technical and people problems uh not one or the other so it's the and people problems that you need to consider yep um so disposability so things start up fast and when they shut down they don't just die they shut down ending off the last of their connections so having a, a graceful shutdown um dev prod parity your dev in production looking the same perfect if not the closer you can get them together the better things are going to be logs treat logs as event streams so not as files oh that's not there because you've got multiple servers multiple processes running they should each be logging separately right so you can't treat them as a file that you're going to go look at on the server you need to send them somewhere so you ship those logs off through standard out and collect them with you know different tool uh, prometheus uh well, not prometheus sorry elk stack splunk um it looks like logplex fluent d or some suggested solutions here um prometheus being monitoring uh time time based event monitoring um run admin management tax tasks as one-off processes so instead of building that into your application specifically having a separate process that can be run 
independent of the application itself is extremely useful. Wow, 45 minutes already. Crazy. Let's see what else have they mentioned here? Yeah, Helm is interesting. Um, I have a problem with Helm. Well, I've used it and it worked, but it can seem like if you're not sharing your Helm chart with someone, I'm not sure that it's as valuable as the trouble it is in building it. Maybe because you're sharing it between your environments. That makes sense, but I, I'm not, I'm not convinced. Um, love to have a discussion about that too. Somebody to fight for it. Um, can't say that I've necessarily fight against it, but I don't know. It just seems like additional overhead that is unnecessary in a lot of cases. Uh, container D, as we just talked about, that's the, the, it's the default in Kubernetes now. Um, yeah, Packer is interesting. That's for building your, building your images. So as I was talking about baking images earlier. Um, Vagrant's fantastic. I use it still. Um, I need to test something in a Linux environment that is based around networking because Docker's networking can be fidgety. Um, I still use Vagrant boxes because it's faster to spin those up than to try to create one in virtual box or something like that. Um, And, you know, it's theoretically cheaper than trying to spin up a cloud-based one. I guess it depends on what your needs are, though. Yeah, Prometheus for monitoring, uh, Grafana for da digital data visu visualization. Um, Envoy. I have not used Envoy. I have definitely used HA proxy and nginx a difference between those is nginx web server ha proxy is a lower level so nginx is a layer seven or layer five Yeah, Nginx is level seven. So that's the application, but HA is a level four proxy. So where is the, there we are. So this is the OSI model for networking. These are the layers of things that get stacked on each other to deliver data over the internet, you know, physical, the wire, the, uh, some of these are not really spoken about so much, really. Like um, the the data link, unless you're an actual network engineer, and I'm talking about somebody who spends all their time in switches and routers. Um, don't talk too much about those. Uh, then level four is the transport. So like. Um, UDP, TCP. And then the higher levels are, are usually just kind of spoken of together, I guess. Um, in general, not specifically always, but that's the difference between layer seven being Nginx and layer four being HA proxy.
meshes i don't know i haven't seen anybody really be using meshes i mean uh, you know they're, they're baked into things like kubernetes so i've not seen anybody really use istio um in production now i mean i'm sure there are people who are but generally it's one of those niche areas um a lot of talk about it but i'm not seeing it become a full-on thing um yeah so it, i think some of the things that are just kind of glossed over are the a lot based in the 12 factor so knowing that 12 factor apps set and understanding them and the need for Understanding when they're needed and when they're not needed is valuable, very valuable. It's, it's going to make you a much better dev, much better dev ops or ops, whatever. Uh, I don't really know where that line necessarily is anymore. You know, I guess dev is more development focused. Dev ops now seems to be just what? system admins slash automation engineers slash um, um, SREs are kind of all lumped in together nowadays. Oh, that was the other thing. Um, YAML tools. So like, stuff about GitOps and uh, Terraform and Ansible, um, things that you build YAML to manage your infrastructure and manage your configuration and installation. Um, and the, and the tools, uh, the, those tools are also used to configure your CI pipelines. So it's, it's all that together, I guess, uh, almost really just call it YAML ops nowadays um yeah so that article took quite a while to talk about something <clears throat> yeah next time um it'd be amazing if there were people who came around and asked questions um or feel free to if you come across this VOD, uh, hit me up on Twitter and let me know if you've got questions and I'll try to answer them next time. Not that I know everything, but I, always nice to have an interesting conversation around topics that we're collectively interested in. So software development, operations, DevOps. Um, you can also see some of the things i've been up to uh, my website needs a little bit of an update but it has a link to my podcast from being a cto uh cto and co-founder talk with dave albert available on everything I, uh, itunes spotify all those things um, but you can see some more there and i uh, don't have a link to youtube but i mean i'm there too um you just search for dave albert devops you'll find me all right i hope that you got some interest value joy something out of this i did thanks talk to you soon <laughs>